Carolina. And our courts exist to resolve disputes and to make sure that the rights of parties are protected. Courts hear two categories of cases, civil and criminal. Our first case this morning is a civil case. Our second case um, today will be a criminal case. Criminal cases are instituted when the prosecutor believes that they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a particular person has committed a particular crime. Um, defense attorneys present any evidence they believe they have that casts doubt on the guilt of the defendant, and they also present any legal arguments for the defendant and point out any legal mistakes they believe the prosecution made. Under both the U.S. and the state constitution, a person accused of a crime generally has a right to a jury trial. Juries decide issues of fact. They weigh all the evidence, they hear all the testimony, and they make a determination as to what they believe actually happened. Uh, criminal cases will end with a jury verdict, either guilty or not guilty. If the defendant is found guilty, they're free to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> if the defendant is found not guilty, they are free to go. If the defendant is found guilty, some type of punishment is imposed. That could be incarceration, it could be probation, it could be a fine. Civil cases are what people think of as lawsuits. These cases involve one party suing another party, um, although government entities can sue and be sued. The suing party in a civil action is called a plaintiff. And usually the plaintiff wants money from the other side. They can also ask the court to direct that the other party do or not do something. Um, unlike in a criminal case, a uh, losing party in a civil case is not subject to being imprisoned. Uh, the civil cases will end in a judgment which establishes the, uh, the rights of the parties. Now, after a trial court case is done, the losing party may appeal to a higher court. There are two lever levels of appellate review in North Carolina, the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, who you're going to see today. Um, now, appellate courts don't hold trials. Instead, they review what happened in the trial court to see if all proper procedures were followed and to ensure that no legal errors occurred. Uh, lawyers conduct arguments in front of the appellate courts, laying out the issues that the court must decide and describing why they believe that their clients should win the case. Um, appellate courts actually decide, they decide issues of law. Um, for instance, they might interpret a portion of the state constitution, they might interpret a particular state statute. But in general, they trust the trial court to determine the facts, to determine what actually happened. All cases are guaranteed at least one appeal, um, except in a few very serious cases, such as when the trial court imposes the death penalty. That appeal is simply to the Court of Appeals of North Carolina. Um, a second appeal to the State Supreme Court is only guaranteed when the judges at the Court of Appeals disagreed on an issue. Otherwise, the parties have to ask or petition the Supreme Court to take the case, and the Supreme Court can decide to take the case or decline to take the case. A ruling by the Supreme Court of North Carolina is final as to any issue of state law. If there's an issue of federal law or the federal constitution involved, then the parties would have an additional right of appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States, which is located in um, Washington, D.C. So today you're going to have an opportunity to hear an argument by the Supreme Court, or before the Supreme Court of North Carolina. Um, we normally sit in Raleigh, but in celebration of our 200th anniversary, we have the opportunity to travel around the state of North Carolina. We're very excited um, to be able to come down east. We were in Halifax yesterday. We're going to be um, in New Bern tomorrow. Don't tell the other cities, but you guys have a special place for me as a pirate. Um, <laughs> So I'm particularly happy to be back in Pitt County. Um, we're also happy to have our um, Associate Justice Robin Hudson speak to you today. She's going to briefly talk about her road to the Supreme Court. So Justice Hudson, let me turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like, Amy says, thank you for your remarks. Um, I'm Robin Hudson, Associate Justice on the Supreme Court, and I'm going to talk briefly about my road to the Supreme Court. First, I want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who don't have to be here for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you, Judge Blunt, and all the hard work people in the courthouse here for doing all the work that you have done this afternoon. You've been so welcome and we really appreciate being here and all of the things that you've done today. 
Good morning. The Supreme Court is absolutely honored and delighted to be able to sit here in Pitt County uh, this today as we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the court's uh, existence. We are so thankful for Judge Marvin Blunt for all of his help and support and his graciousness in making sure that everything was just right for the court. Uh, we appreciate all the commissioners and all the other folks who have been just so gracious and so helpful in everything that you've done and so supportive. Um, to uh, undertake the complete re-outfitting of this courtroom has just been absolutely amazing that you would do such a thing uh, in order to accommodate the Supreme Court. So we are very, very appreciative and it means so much to us to be able to hold this historic session of court here today. Um, there are a lot of really great folks here today. Um, we certainly appreciate, appreciate everybody for being here today. I know that Congressman G.K. Butterfield is here. Uh, there are county commissioners here and uh, a lot of judges, uh, many of whom do not serve in this area. So we're certainly glad to have you all here today. It is noteworthy to know that um, Congressman Butterfield did serve as a, as a judge here in, in Pitt County, and so we're certainly glad to have him here today. We'd also like to acknowledge our former Supreme Court clerk, Christy Roeder. We certainly appreciate her being here today with her mother, uh, Ms. Spear. We'll call the first case on the calendar today, which is Crowell versus Crowell. Mr. Baumgartner. May it please the court. I'm Thomas Baumgartner, and I represent Andrea Crowell, the plaintiff appellant in this case. Before I proceed, Madam Chief Justice, may I reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal? You may. Thank you. For the last 38 years, the law of equitable distribution in North Carolina has limited the authority of a trial court to distribute the marital and divisible property between a husband and wife. This morning's appeal tells a much different story. Instead of distributing the marital and divisible property of Andrea and William Crowell, the trial court has created a series of remedies without consideration of the time in which an asset was acquired or the manner by which a debt was incurred. The divided panel of the Court of Appeals and the underlying equitable distribution judgment should be reversed for three reasons. First, separate property cannot be liquidated to satisfy a distributive award. Secondly, due process requires that all necessary parties must be joined in an equitable distribution action. A trial court cannot exercise jurisdiction over parties or claims that are not before it. And finally, a corporation does not have standing to seek money owed in equitable distribution. With respect to our first contention this morning, 14212 Storts Bend and 14228 Storts Bend Lane were Andrea's separate property and cannot be used to satisfy a distributive award to William. On page 261 through 263 of the record, the trial court makes unequivocal findings of fact that these real properties were brought to the marriage by Andrea. The court also recognizes its limited authority that separate property cannot be reached in equitable distribution. But despite these unequivocal findings that separate property can't be reached, are you saying that it can't be distributed or that the trial court can't do anything with it whatsoever? Your Honor, our position is that the trial court cannot do anything with it whatsoever. And the you, reason you have a, a, a basis in the statute for making that assertion other than the fact that the statutory provisions speak to the distribution of marital and uh, divisible property. Your Honor, the support for our position this morning comes directly from the statutory text. But is the, it the part of the statute that, that requires distribution of marital and divisible property? I'm not an expert in this field, so I get confused on terminology sometimes. That's okay. I'm not either. But the equitable <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get along fine then. <laughs> The Equitable Distribution Act is a statutory cause of action. 
and it has limited remedies. And so our position today is simply that the trial court's judgment was entered contrary to the authority provided by the Act. And that there is a specific statutory provision that says that separate property cannot be ordered to be sold to satisfy a distributed award. Yes, Your Honor, there what, is. What is it? It's specifically 50-20 subsection A and 50-20 subsection D C, subparts 8, 9, and 11. And I would like to take just a minute to walk the court through those statutory provisions. The very first instruction of subsection A tells us that upon application, the trial court shall determine what is the marital and divisible property. The trial court shall provide for an equitable distribution of marital and divisible property. What our courts have interpreted this very first instruction to mean is that in every equitable distribution case, a trial court must undertake a three-part analysis. The first is classification. The second is valuation. And then the third is distribution. And as this court told us some 30 years ago in McLean versus McLean, that following classification, property classified as marital is distributed by the trial court while separate property remains unaffected. Specifically, the reason it cannot be affected is also found in the statutory so, text. So just to make sure I'm following you, Mr. Bumgarner, you are equating distribution with the order that the trial court entered in this case, which required the sale of property. In your view, the two are one and the same? That's correct, Your Honor. If, if we do not buy that, do you have any other authority that you can cite in support of your position? I do, Your Honor. And have, have at it. it. It also comes from the statutory text itself, specifically subsection C-8 is the only time that the statute even mentions the term separate property for purposes of a distribution. And the legislature's instruction was clear. The, the trial court is only authorized to consider any direct contribution to an increase in the value of separate property. There is a significant difference between the consideration of property and the forced liquidation of property that one acquires before the marriage. The statute also tells us what items can be liquidated, and that's subsection C-9. And it's liquidated for the purpose of distribution? That's correct, Your Honor. Subsection C-9 tells us that the court can consider the liquid or non-liquid character of all marital and divisible property. It doesn't say anything about considering separate proper property for liquidation. And that's the same thing. The finding of fact. Doesn't it have a duty to consider the separate property of the party ordered to pay the award? Your Honor, it does not because the, the consideration of the separate property again is listed under sub of factor number nine. And the only time that separate property comes into play at all in the equitable distribution analysis is in the very first step. Once a piece of property has been classified as separate property, it is set aside. It can't be reached. It's sacrosanct. And the defendant in his brief has argued that the court can force the liquidation of separate property under equitable principles. And for guidance on this position, the defendant cites this court to the intermediate appellate court from the state of Ohio. But the reason you can satisfy a distributive award in Ohio with separate property is because the statutory text expressly allows a trial court to do that. North Carolina's approach is the antithesis of the Ohio statute. I have a question, if you don't mind. And subsection eight that you've directed us to, the trial court is instructed by the statute to consider any direct contribution to an increase in value of separate property which occurs during the course of the marriage? That's correct. What does that mean? What does that consideration include? For example, if the property that Andrea brought to the marriage had only been considered in this case, the trial court would have assessed the market value of that property before marriage and as of the date of separation. And as included in the record, that difference, specifically in 14228, would have been 66,000, where the difference between the increase in market value of 2112 was 41,000. 
So if there was a consideration for what William brought to the marriage, it was limited to the increase in value of those properties of $107,000, not $800,000 that was ordered. Is that increase in value then subject to distribution? It is with respect only to marital property though. William does not get a share or a proportion of any of Andrea's separate property. And that so is- So the increase in value that's to be considered in, in, during the course of the marriage of separate property is not to be taken into account in a distribution? That's correct, Your Honor. And that comes directly from subsection B of 50-20, which provides the definition for separate property. Separate property is anything that the spouses bring to the marriage bef before marriage. But the next to last sentence of the definition section under subsection B tells us that any increase in value of, of separate property also always remains separate property. And so when we put these statutory definitions side by side with one another in consideration of what the trial court can do, it can do one of two things. It can order an in-kind distribution, that is the giving of stuff, the car, the contents of the account, or it can enter a distributive award. A distributive award is value. And the definition of a distributive award, also coming from the statutory text, subsection E, says that the only purpose of a distributive award is to facilitate, effectuate, or supplement the distribution of marital or divisible property. Nowhere in the, in in the trial court order, uh, explicitly finding of fact 19 says the court's concern about plaintiff wife's credibility impacts all remaining issues in this case. Prior to that, uh, there were uh, several findings of fact where the court believed that the wife was less than candid in her presentations to the court. Given that and the court's explicit statement about the wife's lack of credibility uh, and given uh, the equitable nature, uh, why can the trial court not craft appropriate remedies when it has uh, specific concerns that the plaintiff in this case, the wife, uh, was not being forthcoming? Your Honor, the trial court is most certainly the best judge of credibility. The trial court has the opportunity to observe the witnesses on the stand and can use the finding as to credibility to affect the distribution of marital and divisible property only. It has no relevance with respect to separate property because separate property is expressly protected by the statute. And I think the it, best- It is protected, at least as I would read the statute, from distribution. It is protected from, from, it cannot be affected in any way. And, the re and again, just to make sure I'm following your argument, the reason you say that is because the trial court cannot, the statutory provisions say that the trial court cannot distribute. That's correct. It's so, that, so, so again, you're arguing that distribution, the, the limits on distribution control the nature of what assets can be used to satisfy a distributive award. That is correct, Your Honor. And is there any statutory provision that specifically says that? Your Honor, the, the most direct analysis of what a trial court can do in the statute itself, again, comes from the first instruction of the what the remedy about, The ones is. that we talked about earlier. And, and, and turning to that point, though, the remedy that's provided by the statute is the only authority a trial court has to craft a judgment. The statute creates the cause of action. The statute provides the remedy. And that's not to say, though, Your Honor, that a spouse's separate property can never be the subject of a money judgment. The cases that we've cited in the brief, beginning with Burgess and Baldelli and Ward, explain how a spouse's separate property can be reached by a money judgment. And those... Let me ask you a quick thing. My understanding from the trial court's order is that as to the Stewart's Bend properties, the party stipulated that they were the wife's separate property. That is, is that correct. That so is to, to that extent, to whatever extent the trial court then had a, any concern about the wife's credibility, it would have no bearing on that determination. Precisely, correct? Your Honor. The pretrial order specifically 
I believe page two, 206 through 209 of the record, the parties have stipulated that those houses were Andrea's separate property. Those findings of fact, those stipulations are incorporated into the trial court's finding of fact. But returning to the remedy that is available, an equitable distribution of marital and divisible property only does not reach separate property, but other causes of action can. And that was the teachings of Burgess and Baldelli and Ward. Those cases present the unique factual dynamic where there are actually two lawsuits filed between husbands and wives, one pending in district court for equitable distribution and another pending in superior court for derivative shareholder actions or claims for constructive fraud or breach of fiduciary duty. The Court of Appeals in those cases recognized that the Superior Court could maintain jurisdiction over the shareholder derivative case because the remedies that are crafted by the statute are different. As the court in Burgess teaches, an equitable distribution, only, the wife may only receive portion of shares of marital or divisible property. She would not be entitled to any separate property. But if she's successful in the derivative shareholder action, she may obtain a judgment against the defendant and the judgment would attach to his general assets. And it is the nature of the statute and the remedy that's provided in 50-20 that makes the judgment that was entered by the trial court contrary to the law. But counsel, equity doesn't have to take a back seat to the statutory law here. And in light of the fact that you've got here marital debts that exceed marital assets, if there are indeed in the weighing of all that is to be separated, an opportunity for the court to say in equity that there should be some apportionment, then why can't these separable properties be looked at in such a way that they can satisfy the debts that come out of the equitable distribution? Your Honor, it raises an excellent point that oftentimes in these cases there are not enough liquid assets to satisfy a distributive award. But the language of the statute prevents the trial court from reaching the separate property. What the trial court can do is create a remedy that was crafted in Embler or in Patterson where in Embler the trial court required the payer spouse to obtain a loan on the marital property. In these other cases that we've also seen, in Peltzer, for example, there was the distributive award was to be paid from income from the marriage. Or in other words, all of these other remedies, future money, does not meet the statutory definition of separate property. It was the intent of the legislature to put it aside to make sure it remained unaffected in equitable distribution. Separate property remains sacrosanct and cannot be reached. And to the extent the Court of Appeals has authorized the liquidation of Andrea's separate property, it should be reversed. So while equitable distribution- How about in this situation where you've got such a blending of, on the one hand, title may be or is in the wife or in her son when she deeded it to him. But on the other hand, you've got loans that the parties obtained against these properties. You have payments made by the husband on wife's properties that are titled in her name. Why is that not a consideration when the court ultimately finds that there's more than $800,000 in debt that the wife owes to the husband? Why can the court not take into account that even though there's separately titled properties, they were treated as subject to loans for both husband and wife? Your Honor, that's an excellent question. And the best opportunity for the trial court to decide the facts related to those transactions would have required the trial court to join all necessary parties to the action. And that's our second contention this morning, is that the trial court could not exercise jurisdiction over parties or claims that were not before the court. And the first contention is that Gentry Kirby was a necessary party because he was the title owner of Andrea's separate property at the time of trial. 
on page 261 and 262 of the record, the trial court your, your, recognizes. Your colleague seemed, if I'm understanding her brief, and she'll have a chance to tell me that I'm not understanding it correctly, she, I'm not. Uh, she argues, among other things, that the fact that the property was transferred after the separation appears to make some difference. If she's arguing, if I, one, is that your understanding of her argument, and then secondly, does it make any difference? Your Honor, to answer the first question, yes, that is my understanding that okay. the transfer of the property occurred after this case was filed, but secondly, it does make a tremendous difference. The transfer of this property occurred in June of 2015. The trial of this case did not happen until July of 2016. So there was plenty of notice, there was plenty of opportunity for William to file a motion to amend his complaint. Well, the, pro the problem I'm having is both of you are arguing that the other one had plenty of opportunity to do whatever each of you says the other should have done. And I'm trying to figure out you know, who, has, who has the obligation in light of the arguments which are almost mirror images of each other in some respects. If the trial court is going to consider the interest of a titled owner without allowing that owner to appear in the action and raise certain defenses, the trial court is depriving that individual or that entity of due process. And that was precisely Judge Murphy's concern in his dissent. The record makes clear that the titled owner was Gentry Kirby at the time of this trial. Yet despite that finding of fact, the trial court says that wife can go and obtain a deed from Gentry Kirby and then sell the property and give those proceeds to William. Or even conversely, Gentry Kirby can pay William $90,000. The Court of Appeals majority recognized that due process applies when we hold someone to a money judgment. And the Court of Appeals unanimously agreed that that $90,000 judgment against a non-party was inappropriate. What's your response to the fact that it's said that uh, the son does not have clean hands because of this transfer being as it was and as a result equity cuts across the equitable distribution aspects here as a result he doesn't need to be a necessary party because he doesn't have the clean hands to go forward in it. Your Honor, I would disagree with that. Even though that was the uh, implication raised by the trial court's judgment, that should not be a finding of fact that's conclusive because Gentry Kirby was not afforded an opportunity to defend himself. And as Judge Murphy correctly recognized that when we're talking about the rescissions of deeds because of fraud or other uh, reasons to rescind an action, it's a statutory cause of action. Chapter 36 says that in order to bring a claim for a fraudulent transfer, there must be an action. And the reason Judge Murphy was concerned about it is because the Court of Appeals majority did not cite a single case where the application of that statute was applied without there being an actual lawsuit and giving the transferee an opportunity to defend himself. Defendant in his brief to this court has not cited a single case where the application of that statute was allowed to take place without joining everyone to the action. Judge Murphy recognized that the reason you must join Gentry Kirby to this action or CKE properties is because the statute itself allows the transferee to assert certain defenses. Payment is a defense. Good faith purchaser for value is a defense. Equitable defenses such as latches or unclean hands are also available to the transferee. Judge Murphy also recognized that because we're talking about a property interest, Gentry Kirby also has the right to request a jury trial under Article 1, Section 25 of the North Carolina Constitution. But even the cases relied upon by the trial court do not apply here. The trial court references briefly a NITCO case and a McCainless case. But looking at those cases, there was already a money judgment entered against the transferee, and there was a action, a lawsuit with a direct claim that was pending before the application of the conveyance statute was applied. In this case, there has never been a claim against Gentry Kirby. He was never joined as a party to the case. There was no summons that was served upon him, though William did recognize the necessity of joining Caroline Kirby Estrada as a third party to the lawsuit because of the very same reason that all necessary parties must be joined in an action 
and the failure of the trial court to join Gentry under Rule 19 of the Rules of Civil Procedure, which is a mandatory instruction that says the trial court shall summon all necessary parties to appear before it. Or in Article 1, or excuse me, in the North Carolina Constitution, Article 1, Section 19, the law of the land clause tells us that no person shall be deceased of his freehold but by the law of the land. In this case, Gentry Kirby was not allowed to present a defense on his behalf. His rights and interests to his real property were adjudicated in his absence. To the extent that the Court of Appeals has allowed such rights to be adjudicated, it should be reversed. For the same reason, CKE Properties is also a necessary party to the underlying equitable distribution case. The law of necessary joinder has been applied multiple occasions in equitable distribution cases, and most recently, as Judge Murphy recognized in Campbell versus Campbell and Guggenhagen versus Guggenhagen, even where the named party to the action is a member manager of an LLC, the assets of which are being contested in the pending ED action, the trial court exceeds its authority when it orders the named party to transfer the assets of the LLC without first. Did, did you make this argument before the Court of Appeals? I, I went back and looked at your brief, and it appeared that you made some reference to CKE, but only in the section of your brief that advanced the argument that you started out, which is that you don't, that the trial court didn't have the authority to allocate to, to require the payment of, of, uh, of a, a distributed award based on contribution from separable property or separate, separate property. Yes, Your Honor. The argument was made in the Court of Appeals, number one, that CKE properties and its real estate interest was Andrea's separate property. It was also argued that CKE properties was a necessary party to the action. The support that was provided by the, in the Court of Appeals, however, was a case that the Court of Appeals found to be distinguishable. In our argument to the Court of Appeals, we cited to uh, Deskovskaya versus Deskovskaya. In that case, a husband and wife owned a house that was titled in the name of their minor child. The Court of Appeals reversed because that judgment was uh, void because the minor child was not joined in the action. The Court of Appeals recognized, the majority at, at any point, recognized that case was not controlling because it dealt with marital property and CKE and uh, the other store bin property was Andrea's separate property. But that flies, that's contrary to what the trial court is allowed to do in the first place. If we're not talking about marital property and we're not talking about divisible property, CKE or Stortz bin had no place in this equitable distribution action. Judge Murphy's dissenting opinion arguing that the law in Guggenhagen was controlling with respect to CKE properties is appropriate to the extent the Court of Appeals has found that CKE part, uh, properties is not a necessary party, it should be reversed. Is it your position that where the law and equity may be inconsistent with one another in looking at the facts and circumstances of this case, that the law and its statutes are going to dictate what happens even outside of what may be deemed to be equitable by the trial court? That's correct, Your Honor. The equitable principles are applicable only to the distribution of marital property. A trial court can provide an unequal distribution based upon the 12 factors that are identified in subsection C. However, as the Court of Appeals taught us in Burgess, the catch-all provision that the trial court can consider any other factor it deems necessary does not apply to separate property. So where law and equity may collide in this case, you say that the statutory law will prevail? That is correct, Your Honor. Quick question about remedy. Um, the Court of Appeals affirmed in part and vacated in part the trial court's order, and you've asked us to reverse the Court of Appeals. Are you asking that it be remanded for the entire trial court order to be vacated, or Your Honor, exactly what? I believe asking? the case of Boone versus Rogers tells us the precise remedy available in this case. The failure to join necessary parties makes the judgment void. It must be vacated, and Gentry Kirby or any other necessary party should be entitled to a new trial. 
Our final position before the court involves an intense, or int it involves a discussion of the factual circumstances that, that basically brought us to this appeal, and that's simply that corporations should not be granted standing to pursue money owed in equitable distribution. This is not a case involving a husband and a wife. William had Alzheimer's disease and never even appeared at the trial of the case. Instead of William's interest being advocated to the trial court, it was provided by the president of his companies, which also happened to be his daughter from a previous marriage. Mr. Baumgartner, you're well within your, in your rebuttal time, but you may continue if you wish. Your Honor, I'd, I'd risk to reserve the remaining portion of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. Ms. Fiorenza. May it please the court, um, Chief Justice, Associate Justices, I am Amy Simpson, and I am a partner with the law firm of Hamilton, Stephen, Steele, and Martin in Charlotte, and I represent William Kroll. Um, as is the case in um, many pieces of litigation, I'm going to have to go completely off my script, and I'm going to address everything, try to address everything that I've heard here so I can give you what I think the answers are to the questions that if you've been asking um, my uh, colleague, uh, because I don't believe he answered them. And so, uh, Justice Irvin, let me be very clear. I think the answer to the question that you asked several times is no. There's no specific, specific statutory provision that says that separate property can never be reached in any way, form, or fashion in I, equitable I, I distribution. Think, I think your colleague was trying to persuade me that uh, you draw such a rule by necessary implication from the fact that the uh, statute repeatedly treats the two differently, and his argument seemed to be that because the statute only speaks to distributing marital and divisible property, therefore the trial court cannot, author cannot order the, uh, a party to do anything with respect to uh, separate property. That appeared to be his argument. Obviously, you don't agree with that. I do tell not. Me. Well, tell me, for those of us who are not specialists in this area, tell me, give, give me your side of that argument so I can consider both of them. Well, first of all, statutory construction um, mandates that you read the statute for what it says. And he is choosing, because it befe beholds his client. Well, he, I think you're both supposed to do that, aren't you? <laughs> that, that, you are, that he's only looking at it from the terms of the actual distribution of marital and divisible property. However, there is a section, as um, Justice uh, Morgan noted, for distributive awards. They're separate and apart from distribution. If all we did, if all the court did, was limited to distributing the marital and uh, divisible property, we would never have a distributive award because you would simply move the puzzle pieces. Instead of saying you get all the 401k in the house or, or you get all the 401k in the house and then you have to pay her a distributive award or him a distributive award over six years, which has been sanctioned by the Court of Appeals, then you would simply say, I will divide the 401k and we will order the house sold and the proceeds divided. But what is the practical difference to the party between actually distributing their separate pro property on the one hand and ordering that it be used to pay a distributive award on the other hand? Well, in this case, it's particularly interesting because um, I believe that uh, Justice Morgan nailed it on the head. There were more asset, there were more debts than there were assets in this case. And not only that, by the time we got to the trial, all of the marital liquid assets were gone. So um, normally, you, you would not get to a distributive award um, situation that you may have to reach separate property, but in this case, every bit of marital property was gone. Ms. Uh, Kroll got $232,188 in liquid marital indivisible assets in the form of IRA, bank accounts, a CD, sales of property. Post separation, she spent it all. Not one penny of it was left. And if you saw the decision, the majority of that was spent on her lawyer. My client received $129,637,000 in liquid monies from same sources, bank account statements, sale of real property. And then they were each given a car and 
two lots in Mexico that they were going to they were ordered to sell if they could, and two timeshares. So, but on the other hand, post date of separation, my client paid eight hundred and eighty seven thousand sixty nine dollars and sixty three cents towards the marital debt with just from the loans from the companies was over 1.6 million. And be, please be careful, this is important for me. Uh, Mr. Bumgarner refers to them as distributions to Mr. Kroll after the date of separation. They weren't. They were loans. No different than going to Bank of America and getting a HELOC or getting a unsecured personal loan. They were actually physical loans against his ownership in separate property. Borrowed money, not distributions as an owner. They over $1.6 million from his companies, both in his name and her name, which I believe, um, if I may, it, it is uh, uh, Justice Newby, I believe you pointed out correctly, that um, the complicating factor in this was the blending. We have his separate property with debts in her name undisputed used to fund this lavish lifestyle that they could no longer afford. On her property, every single property was leaned. Findings of fact, un unchallenged, so they're binding on appeal, was to support their lifestyle. So when, so this goes to two things. Number one, not only her knowledge of that they were using money they didn't have, i.e. borrowing it, but they were also intermingling it with separate property. And so the, this argument that CKE, that technically owned the three homes of real estate, are somehow a necessary party versus a proper party, to me, is it, thrown out the window when you were taking personal loans on those properties for personal purposes. In other words, if CKE needed to be a partner party because it's separate and apart from Andrea, which you'll note, I think I counted five or six times, he referred to these as Andrea's separate property. So he's right. Those houses were Andrea's. They were just in CKE's name for, for either liability purposes, but she used them as if they were her. Does the record contain any findings of fact of the type that are typically seen in a case in which a trial court uh, pierces the corporate veil? Yes. Oh, oh, no, does it say we're piercing the corporate veil? Mm -hmm. No, it says, but there are findings of fact on page, the record 260, um, 2, 263, 270, that all says that these loans were used to support their personal expenses. Are there any findings of fact that indicate in essence that, uh, in essence or directly, that uh, CKE was the alter ego or the instrumentality of uh, Ms. Crowley? That language was not is not found in the actual decision. Is that necessary? And because, because it seems to me that the, what the trial court was attempting to do with respect to this issue was to essentially pierce the corporate yes. veil, but the, 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 is, isn't there some obligation on the part of the trial court to make the findings necessary to support a veil piercing decision in order to do that? Arguably not, because it didn't come up until he challenged that CKE was a necessary party. So I believe that you can look at what issues were actually tried, and she did not dispute. They used it for their spending needs. She did not dispute that well, I guess I guess one of the things I'm struggling with, in, with respect to both this argument and your argument with respect to uh, Mr. Gentry's status, is the question of perhaps there are facts that are in the record necessary to support particular decisions, but first, do the otherwise potentially affected parties, CKE or Mr. Gentry, have a right to be heard and present defenses that they were not? because they weren't able, were not parties able to present themselves, do, one, do they have a, is that potential problem here? And then secondly, even if you're going to treat the two as one and the same as Mrs. Kroll, does the trial court have an obligation to make the findings of fact necessary to do that? 
I would argue they do not have an obligation to make the findings of fact necessary because the issue wasn't raised until on appeal that they were supposed to be necessary and it could be used. Our, was there they evidence? Weren't, weren't raised as an appeal or weren't raised at the trial court? Weren't raised at the trial court. Because I, I, I asked Mr. Yes. Bumgarner I'm about sorry. one of them and I You're went correct. back and found it. It wasn't didn't. raised at the trial court level and, was, and so it didn't come up. Had it been raised at the trial court level, you can see there from the transcripts and even Ms. Curl's own testimony that that uh, she was CKE and CKE were, was her. I will remind the court that she admitted that she lives with her daughter rent free in Myers Mill, which was in the name of CKE and she used it as her personal residence. She rented the, part, the home 14228 that ultimately became Gentry's home at under market value uh, lease rates because it was her son. So she's, if the, the corporation, the LLC had an interest, then arguably doesn't the, if you extend that, then wouldn't CKE have a, 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 an action against Andrea herself because she's not acting in the best interest of the LLC, which to me is just circular logic at the most. Well, was it within the purview of the trial court to make these determinations that, to use your vernacular, CKE was her and she was CKE, or should that have been more properly left with another action, or perhaps the same action, in which CKE and the son, Kirby, were necessary parties so there could be some explanations on the record as to why these relationships were as they were? Well, I would treat CKE differently uh, than the gentry issue, and I'll explain why. With regard to CKE, it basically, whether you look at it as CKE, she held the ownership interest in CKE, or she was an alter ego, what the court did was say, there's nothing left. You don't even have post date of separation income. You're not employed. You live off Social Security and a pension. So there is no marital property, no in, no income coming in to her sufficient to satisfy the distributive award. So when the court says, okay, you owe this distributive award because he's paid over a million dollars in debts that you owe part of, does she have the ability to pay a distributive award? And that's when the court came consider separate property. And the court has sanctioned liens against separate property for the for the establishment, I mean, for the ability to, to satisfy a distributive award. So whether you look at it as one way or the other, the judge says you must liquidate your ownership in CKE that happens to own the real estate. So it is, even with, with CKE, it's, it's not telling CKE to do anything. It's saying you as the owner of CKE must liquidate CKE and sell those assets. And with CKE being, at least on record, a separate entity, cannot, as a necessary party at least, CKE have a chance to come in in whatever form and say, this is how this should be pictured in terms of this relationship, in terms of who we as CKE are which would then lead me to the next question. Did they not have an opportunity to do it because not one piece of evidence was presented that CKE actually follows any legal formalities and Andrea is the shareholder of CKE. So her participating right, in But we're back to Justice Zervin's point. There are facts that arguably could have supported piercing the corporate veil, but right. the trial court didn't make those findings. So Adam, of course, I want the, the order to be upheld in its entirety just as, as it was. But if not, if, if, if the other slight um, compromise alternative was simply return it to the trial court to make those findings a fact that she was, in fact, an alter ego, she was she, but not disturb the actual ruling, just remand it for the findings of fact that the record clearly supports. Counsel, I noted that um, you say that your client or that the wife moved to add some of the companies as a party. Um, but never presented a draft order. Ultimately, Correct. how does that impact your argument about um, who, whether they need to be parties? Well, they only, they move, uh, I mean, it would arguably stand to, well, they abandoned everything about my client's companies. When she had Ms. Tratcher as a, as a counsel, they first moved to appoint a guardian for my client saying because of his memory issues, and then they abandoned that. Then they moved to value his business is trying to, or, or it's all of his separate properties, 
trying to imply a marital component, and then they abandoned that. They sought to add them because presumably they wanted one of those companies to distribute something, and unlike CKE, every single other company to which my client was affiliated had multiple shareholders, books and records, corporate formalities were being followed. So to our, he was never going to have an opportunity to say alter ego because my client wasn't even the majority shareholder. Well, and another question, isn't it true that both um, CKE and Gentry were aware of this action? They could have moved to intervene? That was my next my next point, why I, distri why I distinguished Gentry and Carolyn Estrada, I believe you brought up that we named Carolyn Estrada in the beginning. That is very different because Carolyn Estrada actually was on the deed to the Wood Woodmere Trace home, actually on the deed, but we could, we had, um, our position was, and the judge agreed with me, that my client loaned seventy thousand dollars, and Miss um, Miss Crowell and Miss Estrada put only their names on the deeds, which I think was one of the issues that led to the overall concerns about Miss Crowell's credibility. That the fact that she. Um, uh, put money in a, a bank account in Mexico and refused to produce any documents over it, and the transfer to Gentry, her son, and, and I think that that's a big distinguishing factor, that the transfer came after this lawsuit had been started. And, and, and even though the transfer was made on a certain date, we weren't notified of it. They didn't say, hey, I'm giving the property to Gentry as we got closer to the trial um, preparations. We found it through our own research and completely distinguishable from every single case that has been provided by them is that in every single case where they had to be a, um, the, oh, the title donor, they acquired it by some other method than gift. So all of the defenses that, are, that the Uniform Voidable Transfers Act provides so that Gentry could come in and say, I have these defenses, none apply. Well, how, how but can a trial court make that determination when Gentry himself is not a party and therefore does not have the right to control the evidentiary presentation that's made to the trial court? Arguably in this particular fact situation, and that's what's important about this whole case, I'm, I agree with him basically about the law and what you can do with separate property except for the use of it to satisfy a distributive award. But, and I generally agree that you hold title to property you have a right to be heard. But the exception of this is she unequivocally, unequivocally testified, I gave it to him as a gift because I wanted to because he was my son after this proceeding started. Is, is, is he bound by, as a separate individual, is he bound by that testament? My argument is yes, Why? because he doesn't fit the good, good faith purchaser for value. He does not have unclean but that, that assume All of that argument, your argument seems to be it's so palpably obvious a fraudulent conveyance that the recipient of the conveyance shouldn't be given the opportunity to, uh, there's no requirement that the recipient of the fraudulent conveyance, because the fraud is so obvious, shouldn't be uh, entitled to a chance to be heard in response to the well, allegation. Well, my position. I didn't say that very well, but I hope the Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. What my position is, is that each of the defenses outlined under the Uniform Voidable Transfers Act, not one in any conceivable form could apply to this situation. And Mr. Gentry sat, Gentry called, uh, sat at the council table with her. Well, what obligation, I mean, if, if, if the question is, should his interest in a piece of property be divested, and he's got one apparently by gift, what obligation uh, does he have to intervene in a case uh, when he is not seeking any relief, that instead some relief is uh, granted against him? Well, um, it, it <coughs> is my position that this is an equitable distribution case and that what is that issue is what property existed at the date of separation, because that is the, that's the critical stopping point. And, and at least it was determined to be separate property as of the date of separation. In her name. Right. Or CKE's name. And that a, or, or, what or we're asking. Or whatever was determined. Yeah, what we're asking the court to do as part of, to accomplish equitable distribution, which the court has the ability to do pursuant to, um, 
the, a court can undo a transfer and uh, I don't think anybody has any question that the court in the appropriate set of procedural circumstances has the right to find that the conveyance was fraudulent and to set it aside. I think the real question here is what has to be done in order for a court to have the authority to do that. Well, my argument and, is... And to me, those two are separate questions. Well, in, in my understanding, that the, he only becomes a necessary party if due process cannot be afforded to him and other certain characteristics. He will have due process. He may sue Ms. Crowell for deeding him a pro gifting him a property, and he does, did, took any action in reliance on the gifting of the property when she admitted he knew about this proceeding. So he's not denied due process because he has a remedy against Ms. Crowell. But your argument seems to me he's so palpably wrong. No, she was so palpably wrong. Well, he's so palpably wrong, and the two of them together are so palpably wrong in executing a fraudulent conveyance that he doesn't have the right to be heard in the suit in which relief is granted against him that instead he ought to otherwise be required to take advantage of some other alternative remedy. What, what authority is there for that? Well, I don't believe he's palpably wrong. I believe she's palpably wrong, and he received the gift at his own risk, and that if he and if he believes he's been damaged by receiving a gift that has been rescinded as part of equitable distribution, then he can pursue Ms. Crowell. But under your argument, hasn't he lost the right to the defenses that are available under the Fraudulent Transfer Act? Um, arguably, yes, because again, it was a gift. It doesn't, arguably, it doesn't it, it, it fall within the Uniform Voidable Transfers Act when taken in consideration with the equitable distribution statute because they're both statutory creatures but of equity. And so my argument is he doesn't fall within the protected transferees under the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act. Well, I understand that's your argument, but isn't he entitled to come into court and make a contrary argument? Well, he was in court. Um, but he's not. But he's not a party, and he doesn't because he's not a party. He doesn't have the right by himself, without having to go through somebody else to introduce evidence, right? Well, if he would ask, I would have let him. <laughs> I would not have objected because that was not. The, but I guess it's, a little, it's easy to say now. Monday morning quarterbacking, 2020 being hindsight, I should have said. Unfortunately, we do get a lot up on of the that. sand. We, we do a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking. <laughs> in hindsight, I would have said, Mr. Kirby. Well, is it your position that he cannot be heard because of the equitable aspect of unclean hands or the statutory aspect under the act? It's all of the above. He has unclean hands because he accepted a gift when he knew, he knows, he was actually part of the proceedings, that this property was part of, uh, of the proceedings that issue equitable distribution. Number two, if you analyze each of the, the defenses that are available, under the Uniform Voidable Transfers Act, he doesn't qualify for any of them. So it would be basically a, a nod in judicial economy and exercise in futility if you do not have any of the defenses available. But again, that's your argument. Yes. Um, I want to go back to something you said a few minutes ago that relates to issue one about uh, whether separate property can be uh, adjudicated by the court. You said a few minutes ago that the trial court has the right to consider whether the party upon whom the burden is to pay the distributive award has sufficient assets. But I think Mr. Bumgarner is saying there's a line beyond that that the trial court crossed, that the trial court didn't just consider the availability of the separate property, but then went ahead and, and ordered how that separate property would be used to pay the award. W why isn't it sufficient for the trial court to simply order the award and let the party figure out how to pay it. Well, that would be tr absolutely true if there were other me. If, if and I, I have often said, if she had a bank account with money in it, or had a job, or had anything other than these properties, I might not have as great an argument. But this is all there is, and the statute 50-20E allows you to lean against specific property for a. Um, to establish a distributive award. It's right there. You may lean against specific property, which is why I disagree with Mr. Bumgarner that the Ohio case, I believe he says, are patently obvious or completely, uh, completely opposite, which is not true because the Ohio statute says 
Same language, distributive award, you may lien against marital and separate property. Our statute says you may lien against specific property. Statutory construction in North Carolina indicates if you intended to exclude separate property and leave it only to marital property, they would have written that. So to me, leaning against marital and separate property is redundant because it, that covers both kinds of property. In North Carolina, that's what it does. You may lean against specific property. Doesn't limit you to marital. Doesn't say you can't do separate, which to me says it can. So if you can lean against it and the case says that you may even require, the trial court may even require you to take on debt, get a loan to pay back the distributive award. So in my, my opinion, if you can take, require the affirmative act of taking a loan out, you can lean property, which arguably is separate property, then why can't you do what the court accomplished? Otherwise you're saying, okay, you gotta reduce it to judgment, go through the judgment process and incur more of the government's time and effort because the judgment execution process involves the sheriff. Well, isn't it a different matter to order that she take out a loan against her property, even if it's a lower priority than, than your client might like, than to order that she sell what has been stipulated to be separate property? Arguably, yes, if she could obtain a loan. But she has no ability to obtain a loan because of already the indebtedness on it, and she has no income. She's but does the, does the statute, does chapter 50-20 specifically say that if the person doesn't, is already leaned out to the hilt and they don't have the ability to pay the distributive award, that then the court can order that they sell the separate property? Um, they not in, it does not say that. And there's no cases that say you cannot or you can do it because this is a case of first impression. It has never been that I'm aware of, and unless a decision came down just recently, any decision that says we can't get here, you can't do what they, they did, and that's arguably because this is the most extremely specific set of factors. And at the end of the day, we're under the umbrella of equity, and if you literally, what, what she is asking you to do is say, I could spend all of the marital property, I can lean, and these were found to be marital debts. They leaned his separate property, they borrowed from his separate property, they took out loans that were not repaid, and the, the uh, testimony at the trial was she left him in part because she did not want to pay these loans back. So if you do not order her to satisfy her distributive award knowing that you've said these are the met, these are the only assets that she has to satisfy it, then what you're sanctioning is, um, you know, you can basically gut the marital estate, you can gut somebody else's separate property, but keep mine sacrosanct. And well, I aren't, and aren't you suggesting that if that's the situation, and I'm not saying that's a good thing, that the the court has the authority, even though it's not specifically in the statute, to turn separate property basically into marital property by ordering that it be sold to satisfy the distributive award. Um, that's how it might appear on the surface, except that I will keep going back to, I'm not blanketly asking the, the Supreme Court to say, you can order someone to sell their separate property to satisfy distributive award. I'm not asking for that. What I'm asking for, if there's literally, factually, undisputed, nothing else to reach, zero, no income, no money, <clears throat> nothing else to reach. You cannot let her say, sorry, you're out of luck, you, you paid a million dollars and I'm not having to pay any part of it. So you're saying this should be a narrow decision by this Very court. narrow decision because it is a crazily narrow fact scenario. It is the live beyond your means on steroids. I mean, it is a very unfortunate event. And it's, I go back to White v. White, the 312 uh, NC 770 Supreme Court opinion, 1985, that states very clearly, marriage is a partnership enter enterprise. 
which entitles both parties to share in what it creates, good or bad. We've spent a lot of time talking about mar distributing marital property when the marital property to distribute in this case is a debt with a lot of zeros. So if you do not follow white v. white, you're saying, Mr. Crowell, you bear the burden of the debt. She got more of the assets already. So what is the workable rule that you would ask us to adopt in our decision that, in that would the, apply to future cases? That in this particular case. Well, I know, but we always have to think about future yeah. cases. What's in the rule? In future cases, if there are far more marital debts than there are assets to satisfy them, and there is nothing left to transfer from the marital estate, there's no other source of money, no income, no job, no other assets from which to satisfy a distributive award, the last and best resort is to require that she liquidate the that her separate estate. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is if, if you say she owes this, but you couldn't order it sold, she, it's been ordered for her to pay. Ms. Simpson, if, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Rebuttal. I wish to make just one brief point on rebuttal, and I'd like to conclude with the very same analysis upon which our discussion began. The Equitable Distribution Act is a statutory cause of action with limited remedies. Separate property cannot be reached. When you have circumstances of bad faith or insufficient liquidity to make the parties whole, as Justice Morgan pointed out, additional claims must be brought. Additional cases must be brought. But when the only remedy you seek is an equitable distribution of marital and divisible property, separate property cannot be liquidated. Counsel, isn't your argument actually asking us to find that different remedies for when there's an in-kind distribution versus when there's a distributive award? Because you would agree that if there was an in-kind distribution and the other party refused to give the property, the, the court could, could order the property to be given to the other party without having a separate civil judgment enforcement action, right? Yes, Your Honor, if the property at issue is marital. However, when a person's separate property or separate assets, that is not part of an equitable distribution action. That's what Burgess teaches. That's what Ward teaches. That's what Baldelli teaches. Separate property just cannot be reached in equitable distribution. And, and you don't think that the fact that the marital debt, which is joint debt, that was, that this property was used to secure doesn't change the nature of this property being a wholly separate property? Your Honor, I see you my time about two has seconds expired. to answer that question. You can say yes or no. Your Honor, marital debt is divided among the parties, but the means to pay it is through marital or divisible property. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel. Madam Clerk.